Welcome, my name is Ranjita Jyotkar and I'm a certified trainer with the Center for Nonviolent Communication. Uh, I run a firm called Connext Coaching and Facilitation where I offer workshops and one-on-one -on -one work, public workshops as well as workshops for individuals, organizations, teams, and I do one-on-one -on -one work. Uh, today, I'm going to be in conversation with Mansi Satsena, who's the founder of Encompassion. Hi, Mansi. Hi, good to be here. And Mansi is a certified trainer with the Center for Nonviolent Communication. And today, we're going to be talking with Mansi about the work she does that brings NVC and social change together. Um, but before that, Mansi, can you tell us a little bit about Encompassion, what Encompassion does? Sure. Um, yeah, Encompassion started out as a sort of personal offering into the world where I was learning and growing with nonviolent communication. I was a certification candidate and I wanted to offer, it started out like an idea that was much, quite intimate and internal and close to my heart. Um, but we were basically becoming a training firm. And then somewhere around last year, we had a huge recalibration of what we were doing. Um, and this happened in the context of the riots in Delhi and the COVID uh, migrant crisis, where it became very clear that if we were an organization in service of community, uh, showing up for caring for the community in more active ways was really what brought us more meaning. So we've had a kind of a huge turnaround in terms of our direction and vision and what we're trying to do. Um, now we're sort of focused on building, I mean, we have a project called Living Bridges, which is inspired by a vision, which is about nurturing living bridges that bring nonviolent communication, the consciousness and uh, processes to social change work. Um, and we, we do this through workshops and trainings because that's of course what we've done all along and we, we're very comfortable in that space. Um, we also do emergency relief work when it's needed um, in which we concept, we see ourselves as bridges even in that space really. Um, and we do community development work, which is sort of um, nurtured by some of the pieces that make NVC what it is. So mm -hmm. that's the essence of it right now. And uh, you mentioned this name, you know, the name of your project is Living Bridges. Tell us more about the name and what it means in the context of the work you do. So Living Bridges is, um, of course, it's inspired by the Living Root Bridges in Meghalaya, like, which is basically bridges that are built with, through the roots of trees across rivers, built over a period of time, built by communities, which are incredibly resilient and hold out against all kinds of natural disasters, you know, all, this, all, all kinds of seasons and have withheld the test of time. Um, in the context of what we do, it has to do with, um, in a very logistical and kind of straightforward sense, it's about bridging the world of NVC and social change, which means bringing the consciousness and awareness and capacities that come with NBC training to social change work. And it's also about bringing um, the depth and I guess the real, the real time impact that social change work has to NBC and marrying those two spaces. But it goes a little deeper because um, it's also about create, looking at what makes, what, what is that point, the intersection or the bridge between what's inside of me and what's outside of me. Um, it's about what is that point of connection between me and another human being um, and in a very real sense about it's about finding myself in the context of community and finding the community inside of me so mm -hmm. that's what it refers to it's about this beautiful point of center um, yeah that's that's what it's about and the, I mean the way we do it in a practical sense is it's about um, we have workshops that have so far focused on a sort of um, a kind of kaleidoscope of different modalities from NVC to related internal work modalities, largely around somatics um, and some other pieces and uh, things that lean more towards systemic change, social change, social awareness. Uh, moving forward, we're taking the NVC and social change aspects very seriously. So we're going to have um, concrete trainings that are with 
because we've also received a lot in this work and so people are showing up and offering themselves and so trainings with traders who have actual field experience and um, experience in the field that they're in the areas that they're speaking about um, which could be from spirituality to parenting to relationships to actual systemic work and workshops and webinars with people who are social change practitioners in the social sector as well as in the corporate sector with an understanding of even the corporate world magical and fantasy like as it seems existing within the context of the larger planet so that's kind of the work we're doing right now with that what i'm, what I'm getting is also this is like almost like a tapestry of all the different kinds of experiences that we have as human beings that are coming together to really support the work that's happening. Absolutely. It was also because um, the idea that our experiences are alienated from each other, that, you know, different parts of us live in different boxes, like this, the spiritual world and personal growth and relationships and systemic change and my career or my job and making money as if these are dissonant parts of ourselves that have to be kept in different boxes. And that's actually, in my mind, that's part of a narrative that creates much more separation and alienation in the world anyway. Mm -hmm. So it's about bringing those things together as well, looking at each of us as nuanced, um, you know, well, kaleidoscopes inside of us, actually, in a sense, like we're all, we're all of these pieces and all of those pieces matter. So how do you bridge those? Mm -hmm. How do I create aliveness in the bridges between these pieces? So you spoke a few minutes ago about Encompassion started as an offering in of learning spaces, so to say, and, and at a time when you were a certification candidate. And at some point, something happened and you decided, this is when I want to go out into the community and do something more actively. Uh, can you tell me more about what really prompted you to say, you know, this is the moment, this is when I think I want to step up and do this. And this is what I want to do. Mm. There's a couple of moments that were pretty transformative. Um, one happened a couple of months before the Delhi riots broke out. And this was a sort of interpersonal moment in an NBC workshop in, in the IIT that happened in Kerala, um, where Father Chris basically was talking about certification as conceptualized by Marshall Rosenberg, who's the founder of NBC. Um, and it seems that Marshall Rosenberg himself pretty much said that certification without community has no meaning. Mm -hmm. And it stayed with me because a lot of these um, ideas that we have about, you know, becoming something, getting a certificate, being certified, uh, getting a degree for that matter, all of these things, again, it's like if you keep it in alienation from the rest of the world, it makes not, doesn't make too much sense. And I have a history of walking away from degrees like that. I have an MPhil in history, mm -hmm. which I love to do. Um, but absolutely, I know that my work had no real life impact. It did not reach more than two or three people. And those three people quite liked it, mm -hmm. but it didn't have an impact in, on the planet. And that's where it lost meaning for me. Um, so when Father Chris said that, for me, that really brought this piece home about NVC work. And what brought me to NBC in the first place. Because while you're on the certification track, um, when you're kind of moving towards this goal, often one can become very streamlined and start thinking about it in terms of getting certified. Um, and I really needed that moment to kind of remind me about what brought me here in the first place. And then it was already kind of floating around in my head. I had sort of stopped doing my trainings. I'd started spending time at a de-addiction center in, in Noida where I live. Um, around and at the end of, and there was a lot of political strife brewing in Delhi at the time. And um, of course it has an impact on many levels. I, um, and towards the end of Delhi, when the Delhi riots happened, um, you know, I had this sort of sense in my body since, father, since I spoke to Father Chris about this and I had the sense that get up and do something, follow your feet, do something different. You don't, it doesn't matter if you don't have the whole picture, but do the next thing that you can, that's available to you. So I started doing that. And then when the riots happened, I still had this sort of, this, this sort of almost inertia of actual movement, but trapped in one single space. Like I was ready to be launched into the world and I was waiting for the right moment or the right call. And I realized there were so many people longing to contribute 
people mm -hmm. with money who had resources, people with rations, again, people who had resources and people who were willing to be on the field and contribute their service in their time. And, mm -hmm. and what was missing was a connecting device, like not connecting device, but a connecting person or a connector um, or a system that connects them. And I thought I can do that. And it was just a thought in my head. And I think somebody in the relief network in Delhi said, you know, why don't you come and talk to this person with me? And I said, okay, sure, I'll do that. And it just sort of started rolling after that because they, all I did was respond to what was immediately in front of me and then something more unfolded and then I responded to that and then that and then so on and so forth. And it, it just, um, it brought home some of these pieces. It was so important to learn this. I, um, I'd spent a lot of my life waiting for like a perfect plan to emerge, but there are no perfect plans. And actually, and that, that whole idea involves, you know, requires us to be living in the future. Whereas actually what's happening is right now, life is about this present moment. So, um, and I think it just, it was just, a, it was very organic to show up where I showed up. And then from that point to, from the riot relief work, transitioning into COVID relief work was even more organic. We were already on the ground. We could see this tsunami of, um, you know, hunger basically coming. And, um, and since we had the systems and we had the resources, we just responded. Mm -hmm. And then from that point, it also became clear that as we were doing this work, once that the biggest fire was put out, which was the crisis of hunger and migrant crisis, mm -hmm. It wasn't exactly put out, but once that started dying down, uh, there was suddenly opportunity, not opportunity, but there were spaces where people were still struggling. They had lost their livelihood. Um, and at this, by this point, actually, this was community. This, is, this was my community. These were the people I was working with. So it was, very, again, very natural to say, okay, let's now work with this community and see what happens. And it just, um, I think it built itself. Um, I, I see myself as in service of connection and I've only been taking one step at a time in that direction. And that's honestly what I've been doing. Um, for many of us who might have some sort of a, you know, a wish to offer something to the community and perhaps our waiting, you talked about there is no perfect plan, but for some of us, we like to uh, think about things in a very structured way in the absence of a plan or in the absence of knowing what tomorrow brings, especially what, uh, and I'm yeah. guessing this is what happened when COVID hit. Yeah. What do you rely on? What do I personally rely on when I don't know what's coming? Um, thank you for that question, because actually this is, this is the only constant. I rely on two things. I rely on my breath mm -hmm. and I rely on my intention. Mm. Um, the breath is, of course is just, it's just one that comes from many pieces around presence building and meditation and so on and so forth. But mainly it means, so the, your breath is basically the only autonomous function in your body that you can control. So regardless of how out of control I feel with in the context of the larger world, I still am in control of myself. And it reminds me of that in a very tangible way. I have choice. I can choose how I respond. I'm not in control of the circumstances, but I am in absolute choice and control of myself. And I have, and then I can choose what I focus my intention on. Um, and because, and this is, I think, um, the absolute foundation of NVC is the intention to connect. Mm. Um, so that kind of becomes almost like a guiding principle, mm. especially when things are very chaotic or they're scary, or you've lost a lot of money, or you know, you not lost money, but you don't have any money. Um, yeah, we've never lost money because we've never had a lot of money to lose, but we, you know, you, you don't know where your resources are coming from. You don't know how it's going to happen. And I think coming home to that intention to connect and trusting in that um, is mainly what I do. I mean, it's the most regular thing I do. I don't, that's, there are other practices, but that's kind of the heart of all. And I'm also guessing a large part of this is kind of like giving up the idea that there's only one way in which you'd like things to pan out. Or oh yeah, for sure. That's the other piece, I guess. It's like, um, like I said, I don't think we're in control of what happens to anybody else. And I think it's also not our business to be in control of that. Mm -hmm. 
I only have, I mean, I have choice over myself for a reason. So, I mean, I can be, I can really hold that. Um, I see the idea of, I've dealt with this kind of quest for perfection almost all my life. I like being the perfect student. Mm-hmm. I like getting my A pluses. I want to be the best friend. All of these things I want. And it's something um, I'm encouraged to be. Sorry. And we're in, absolutely encouraged to be there because that's where the approval lies. And that's where, you know, um, a, a certain kind of belonging does lie in that sort of um, way of living. And yet that's not actually belonging because I may be, I'm usually compromising some parts of myself when I'm, you know, being something perfect. I realized for myself that that idea of perfection is basically, it's shame wrapped up in a very beautiful idea. Mm-hmm. So it looks like a pretty dream, mm-hmm. but in fact, it contains a quality of shame or, or fear that I won't belong or fear that I won't fit in or fear that I'll fuck up, which, you know, happens. Um, and there's something about radically accepting myself just as I am in every moment that contributes to this work quite heavily. Um, yeah. Yeah. Does and that answer your so, question though? Yes, it does. And I'm, this idea of perfection that you describe also sounds like this belonging will be offered to you only if you fit into this box that, that has a predetermined shape and size. Mm-hmm. Yeah, for me, um, what comes up is there's this idea that Anina Kashtan has around. I heard it from Miki Kashtan, which is about the it's a civil it's about a civilizational lie, and the civilizational lie is that you can either have belonging, safety, acceptance, or you can have autonomy, choice, and freedom. Um, to my mind, a lot of the structures that exist. And most of those structures were what fell apart entirely when the COVID crisis happened. Um, are based on this lie or this game that we play about how much can I, how much of myself can I, you know, compromise in order to fit in and how much of, how much can I get away with without losing freedom? Whereas actually, and, and those are not the questions I want to be asking myself. That's really not the game I want to be playing. The game I would like to be playing is the game of, you know, well, well, it's not a game exactly, but I would really like to move towards the idea that each of us matters as we are, and that's enough. Mm-hmm. Um, and not only is that enough, I think it's a really critical thing to, in my experience, um, buying into the idea that I'm imperfect or buying into this this lie that you know the shame is trying to teach us is not just harmful for myself, it's also incredibly hurtful to, not hurtful, but it has an impact on people around me. Mm. Um, And the reason I say that is because to my mind, um, you know, you with your circumstances and your resources and what you've managed to learn in your lifetime, you are the only, and you're the only person who is exactly where you are with exactly what you have. You're the only person who can do exactly what you can. I can't do that. And that's the same for me. But if I start believing that I'm not good enough, I don't step up in the ways that I can step up. Mm. And that um, that has as much of an impact as if I do step up. Mm. So I think it matters much more if we allow ourselves to show up imperfectly mm. or imperfectly or perfectly imperfect, whatever that might be. Um, allow ourselves to show up as we are and trust that that's enough. And I think somewhere that also, and in a practical sense, it means, and it's very practical, it means on a day-to-day basis, dealing with all this, the echoes of these stories that have been told to us about us not being good enough or the world not being safe enough. Mm. So that's, yeah. Um, It's interesting you talk about not being perfect enough, uh, not being perfect, being imperfect and showing up anyway. Uh, one of the questions, one of the things I've been reflecting on is this whole idea of cancel culture, which seems to have somehow magnified so much since we've had social media. All, mm-hmm. you know, somebody puts out one comment online and or somebody finds a comment of mine that I posted, say, a few years ago, and then I, I'm getting called out and canceled based on something that I'd put in there. And it seems to be so different from what you're describing in terms of um, it's almost like there's an expectation that you need to be perfect, that you need to be um, very, very aware of everything that's happening. And that's the only way, that's the only acceptable way to uh, work in any sort of social change. 
absolutely how this yeah how do you deal with this how how does one deal with this at all i think it's for me that has something to do with um choosing to live with non violence in my life as a quality of being and to do that i need to understand what that means a little bit um which uh, one of the qualities as i understand it is about and this will sound slightly um in the direction of spiritual stuff but it's really a tangible human practical thing around forgiveness mm-hmm. um and in fact martin luther king talks about forgiveness uh, gandhi talks about forgiveness which is just a quality of i think somewhere allowing for these imperfections also in the other um i would and I, in a way it brings me back to the idea that there is something that's going on inside of me and there is a, that, and that reflects on the outside because i'm holding other people with as much um prejudice and anger as i'm holding myself so i'm waiting for myself to have to for myself to be perfect i'm also waiting for other people to be perfect perfect in their own ways and basically i'm setting up my setting myself up for a lifetime of alienation and disappointment because neither of us is going to get there there is no, there's no point at which we stop learning as mm-hmm. thing and that's essential and that quality of learning i think is also essential to our species as survival no like that's how we have survived on this planet by learning and growing and mm-hmm. connecting with each other um so yeah i mean what what i'm talking about is incredibly is very very different from that kind of um that quality of thinking and it reflects it becomes very important on the field as well because um uh nobody who shows up is exactly the right person that's an and at the same time whoever shows up is the right person mm-hmm. they may just not look like the person i was expecting to show up so i might be expecting you know in some cases actually i was expecting uh people who are very socially aware and maybe extremely liberal to show up and and for sure some of those people were showing up and who ended up showing up was a policeman but he was the person who was there um and he was there out of a longing to serve and now i could hold him accountable for everything else that i think you know i whatever anger i have or whatever prejudices i have about um uh, stories i may have heard or internalized and he could do the same for me you know i'm wearing my t-shirt and my jeans and walking around and i'm i don't bother with the traditional get up of indian women and and at the same time we i think for both of us it was very clear that here we are we're united by purpose we're united by values and and that's enough because it's not about uh, holding each other in accountable for perfection it's about holding us together accountable to our values which is about connecting with other people and serving life so i think that exists in every human being mm. um i don't think that calling people out um aggressively online and personalizing what is a very systemic kind of thing leads to any kind of change i don't know anybody who's convinced anyone to do differently because of something that happened online so and so i'm i'm getting that this is really about focusing on the shared values of why we here and when something happens we call each other in with more compassion than with saying you know now i'm just going to cut you out of this because you don't deserve to be here so to say absolutely um yeah i don't think i could have said that better Mm-hmm. it's um i think and at the same time i think it's a little simpler than it sounds gets very complicated when you say it like that but i think it's at the end of it it's about a sim it's the simplicity of nbc and it's the simplicity of that idea that it's about my intention to connect mm. it it if my intention is there no matter how difficult it is i can take i can move an inch towards that mm-hmm. um in the practical living of it i think it comes down to those decisions we make moment to moment mm. and a lot of the thinking and trying to figure it out um uh, is helpful to understand what's going on mm-hmm. and it's not exactly what supports movement when it comes down to it so for me it's actually in some ways very complex but in some ways it's actually very very crystallized and very simple mm-hmm. straightforward and speaking about the practice of nvc um 
as an NBC practitioner who's committed to working in the social space, how does your practice of NBC really inform the work you do? Um, because there are some, some things that you're doing that could be seen as purely logistical if it's about distributing, uh, you know, groceries and, you know, necessities to people who are in distress, things like that. How does NBC come into this? I think it comes in, in, a, in two or three layers. Um, one is around, one is very practical about how we organize ourselves within the team. And here, while we, to, to a great degree, we do use principles of NBC. We may not be saying, when I see you do this, therefore I feel this, and then that's because my need is, etc. We don't always do the OFNR training wheel sentences, but I do think we focus heavily on our needs and each other's needs. And there's generally a sense of holding the other person as a whole human being with their own experiences. Um, and, you know, um, and I think to a great degree, and not, not, I don't think, but I do know to an extreme degree, actually all of the community work that we've done was informed by essentially this idea that um, it's not so much about us coming in and fixing something, it's about us coming in and offering what we have to offer as human beings to other human beings and really being open to receiving what comes from them. Mm -hmm. So that's on a very consciousness level thing that's included. We've included some pieces in our systems that may not look like OFNR in every moment, but we do have um, systems that allow for internal reflection mm -hmm. and then letting that transfer outwards come back and reflect again because i think that um, so that we hold feedback as a, i mean so that we hold all these pieces as a, as a flow between us and the people we're working with um, i think there is a difference when you're approaching supplying groceries or supplying rations to people um, in between, I mean, I think there are ways to do it which involve numbers and creating these number-driven sort of impact figures. Um, it can be also about very one-sided philanthropic giving, which is, there's nothing wrong with that. Uh, it's, a, it's an act of giving, um, but it's very one-sided in my understanding. And on the other hand, when when we go into the field and we offer what we offer, whether it's rations or water or whatever, um, and we do it with the consciousness that the giving is actually us receiving, mm. with the awareness that hunger and the need for food is as human and as beautiful a need as uh, empathy or connection or belonging or discovery. Um, and maybe taking it a step further that when somebody is hungry for food, when that is the primary need, that, you know, I mean, I challenge anybody to go through a day, you know, without eating, unless you're intermittent fasting or anything, but go through a day or two without eating and notice like the essence of one's entire humanness, my entire being becomes channeled into this, this one need, which is the need for food. Uh, so when we meet somebody who is hungry and, and wanting food, or when that is the thing that's on the table, to me, it means that's the entire essence of that human being that we meet. Mm. And it's not about us fixing or making something better, but it is about the privilege of receiving that person in that moment. And it definitely does not have anything to do with OFNR. Um, in fact, in that moment, OFNR would be offensive to use, but... Mm. It is about understanding connection as a flow of giving and receiving. It's about, um, and it's about somewhere anchoring everything we do with the intention to connect. So I think that's how it marries with what we do with the NBC pieces. And that, you know, what you're describing, that sort of a relationship, I'd even call it, um, requires us actually to look more closely and question our own ideas or culturally inherited ideas around the giver is the bigger one yeah. or as somebody with say for example more education or more access i know better what people need than so i'm going to decide what you need yeah. look at me you know i'm giving is selfless 
And these are ideas we commonly hear around um, even the word charity, for example. Absolutely. Sounds like, sounds like in, you know, it's, it's really about these ideas of giving is so selfless and look mm. at me, I'm giving, you mm. know, and someone mm. else is needy. Mm. That's the word often, right? Yes. Yeah. And these are ideas that are also built into our systems because if you are running a nonprofit, the nonprofit does not function. The world of the nonprofit doesn't exactly function without the world of profit making enterprises. It's built into the system. So when there is all this, um, so giving has to be reported back in terms of impact, and the impact has to count against money that is given to those organizations. It's a complex series of things. So on the one hand, yes, it, there's also conflated ideas in our heads about you know how much how beautiful it makes me when I'm the giver in the situation, etc. Uh, which actually is uh, you know, I think in the mental health realm, that's called codependency, but uh, but it's also systemic. And it's very, uh, it's a tricky thing to find yourself in a place where you can hold um, yourself as the receiver mm. when you're, oh, you know, the, the things you're doing look like giving. And that requires humility. It requires a certain degree of humility, yes. It and requires... A degree of humility and it requires a degree of um i think okay i think it requires a degree of like audacious humility mm -hmm. because on the one hand um it's about that moment when you see this i can't i mean for me that has been one of the, the most profoundly learning experience of the last year was this understanding around food as the essence of the human being and there's nothing more humbling than being in that presence mm -hmm. um, and on the other hand to be able to kind of hold that as sacrosanct I need to be able to sort of also say all right I see the you know structures that are in place I need to exist and coexist with these structures and yet I need to be clear about where my boundaries are. I don't want to be giving um, I can't be otherwise I stand to become something like a you know we could be just as easily become an evangelizing kind of organization, whereas what we want to be is something different. Mm -hmm. yeah. <clears throat> um, tell us a bit more about In Compassion's work that's outside of the social space. I know you run a, uh, the Living Bridges program, which is a series of learning opportunities. So tell us more about this. And I'm also aware that one of um, one of the intentions of Living Bridges program is to support people into moving into social change yeah. to start from where they are. So I'd love to hear more about that. Um, you mean outside? So are you talking about outside of the community development outside space? Of the community 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 community. Community. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I mean, at the moment, we have two pieces that are that are completely that are actually uh, sort of cohabitating with the community development and emergency relief pieces. One is around Living Bridges, which is the offerings that we offer into the world for NVC practitioners who would like to be, who would like to know how to make real impact. And maybe there's a certain quality, I mean, saying, considering that I've been talking about receiving, I like to say what I receive from that is, is really hope because I do believe that 50 people practicing NVC seriously at the grassroots level in this country would change the world. Like I, I, I can, I have so much faith in what this modality brings and um, and the creative energy that it can unleash on this planet. So I, that's kind of the motivation behind Living Bridges. Um, I've spoken already about the kinds of workshops that we're offering. And the other thing that we do is we do offer trainings and services to people who would like to receive trainings for their organizations or communities or even coaching relationships. Um, so some of us who are NBC, well, um, I'm a trainer that we have candidates and we have people who are informed by different modalities um, are able to offer support for those organizations. So that's part of what we do as well. If somebody wanted to a find out more about the work you do, where could they look? And if they wanted to support the work you do in whatever way, what uh, what are the kinds of support you that would really help your work keep going? I love the second question. Thank you. Let <laughs> me. So um, the first. The, to find out more about what we do, you can visit our website, which is www.ncompassion.com, or there are um, you can write to us at connect@ncompassion.com, and uh, I think there's a also Living Bridges 
is run by the forum coordinators and that th they can be found at livingbridges at incompassion.com. Um, I mean, I can provide all these links for you if you like, and there's some more links as well. Um, the way we, I think there are several ways to support us. One is to, we are now a section eight company. So we're very happily able to accept uh, contributions from people who'd like to support this work. If you want to only contribute financially, that is perfectly okay. If you'd like to contribute in terms of, you know, coming to a workshop and learning and then taking that back and um, spreading the word about what we do, that would be fantastic. These are online um, workshops. These are the online workshops, yes. yes. Everywhere in the world can participate. As of, the, as of now, they're all online and therefore everybody in the world can participate. And, you know, we'll see how it shapes up going forward. And um, yeah, I mean, we, well, the other, the last piece of, is I think we can, Living Bridges is also like a membership based community. Um, and this is much more of a give and take relationship. We, it's not priced very high. Um, it's basically around the cost of a meal outside um, per month. And this is for people who are really seriously committed to the idea of living non-violence on the ground. So no matter how much NVC you have, if you come from the social sector field, if you are an NVC practitioner, it's a space to kind of come together and learn and hopefully map your journey as you, um, it could, you might want to take on a project or you might want to do something completely new. You might just be exploring yourself, but having a community to travel with really nourishes us as well. At some point, um, we are in the next month or so, most likely we're going to set up a call for volunteers around different parts of our work. Um, so you could contribute to end compassion sitting wherever you are on the planet. And that would be very, very welcome. So what's coming up next at End Compassion? Up next, we have a large number of exciting trainings coming up with Living Bridges. Um, in April, we're hosting Father Chris and Daya talking about living nonviolence uh, in a conversational training. That's not a standard training. It's like having a community to talk to and journey with. Even if it's online, I think it'll be really intense. Uh, at the end of April and early May, we're hosting Sarah Payton for three three days, and um, yeah, and very quite excited about that. Um, and she's going to be talking about privilege and shame in with the NVC modality. And towards the end of, uh, I think it's the end of May, we'll have a five week course with Aya Caspi on the spiritual processes of NVC. And alongside this, we also have weekly workshops, which are like I mentioned, they'll be a balance between NVC workshops and social sector trainings, which include um, include pretty cool things actually along like there's parenting with NVC and organization building in the social sector with uh, Mustafa Muchala. And there's, um, uh, you know, we'll have actually we'll have you con doing something around relationships, which is pretty cool. Um, Actually, I think that might be a secret I just let out, but I think you're doing a workshop with us in June around requests. And then hopefully later week in August, we're hosting you for the workshop on relationships. Um, oops, secret. And, um, and at the same time, we have say in the coming three months, we have Ajay MK who will be doing a workshop on compassion-based resilience training. Mm -hmm. So it's quite an interesting balance of very, very experienced and generous facilitators who have been who are joyfully offering their time and I'm just so grateful. That's Living Bridges. And the other thing that we're doing now is we've kind of finished one run. We're almost at the edge of finishing, completing a run with Project Asha with one community. And we hope to expand to three more communities. Uh, and we're basically, as we do this, we're also learning. So we're putting together kind of a resource base uh, for people who would like to make similar steps in the social sector so that eventually uh, we're not the only ones doing it. Mm -hmm. um, and hopefully that would be something we can offer through Living Bridges as well. And I, that's kind of the flow of End Compassion is Living Bridges. Uh, all the money we raise from Living Bridges contributes to Project Asha and all the learnings we get from Project Asha contribute to Living Bridges. So mm -hmm. that's how we've been mapping that. That's what's up. And that, I guess, is the flow of giving and receiving that you were talking about. Yes, exactly. That's the whole idea. Thank you so much for talking to us today, Mansi. I'm uh, I've really enjoyed this conversation. I've learned so much more about your work that I was a little familiar with when we started, and I know so much more about all the exciting things you're doing. And I'm waiting uh, to know more about you know to enroll for your upcoming workshops. Thank and you. to offer upcoming workshops. <laughs> like, to offer upcoming workshops. Yeah. Yes, that too. 
Believe so, me, we're roping you into the entire thing. Just so you know. For anyone who's watching, I'm going to put Mansi's uh, and the End Compassion team's contact details and information on how you can follow them and how you can support their work in the text accompanying this video. Thank you so much for watching.